Last June, AGS selected a new chairman and president. Our emeritus chairman, Mr. John Gould, had served 20 years as chairman, 16 as president before that, and a member of the council for many years before that. In fact, we're not sure, but it's probable that John has served AGS in an official leadership capacity over 40 years, longer than anyone ever has in the history of AGS. Jerry Dobson, our emeritus president who served as AGS as president while John was chairman, has also guided AGS through thick and thin. For many years, he has made endless contributions to AGS, not always so public, but always substantive. There are many in this room that know without John and Jerry, AGS could not have survived. John and Jerry, please stand. I speak on behalf of everyone present. You are why we are here today. And that brings us to our new chairman. I purposely chose to recognize John and Jerry now because our new chairman is the result of their doing. And like their work over the years, they did a great job. Three years ago, Chris Tucker joined AGS the same time I returned to serve as executive director. Jerry is the one who recognized raw talent in Chris and convinced him to join the council. And for those of you who know Chris, Raw is probably the most accurate description we can give. Chris immediately became interested, or perhaps afraid, of what he had bought into, and soon became one of our most active counselors. I watched as he understood the very delicate balance of maintaining the long and storied historical, geographical nature of AGS, while at the same time helping us to develop a plan to take us into the geospatial future. John and Jerry welcomed his ideas and not always conventional plans to implement them and knew that Chris was someone to carry on their work and continue the geographical leadership that has been a hallmark of AGS since 1851. Besides his most cherished role as a husband, father, and son, Chris is an entrepreneur, a scholar, and a businessman, many of the attributes one would want in a chairman. But most importantly, he is a tireless champion for geography and geospatial science. I don't know of anyone more dedicated to this important cause, the cause of AGS, than Chris. Please welcome the chairman of our symposium and the new chairman of the American Geographical Society, Dr. Christopher Tucker. Great. Good morning. All right, thank you very much. John. Thank you for the kind words. None of that was written down in the run of show. So it caught me a little off guard. Um, thank you for coming. Who's been to all three Geography 2050s? You came back. This is the third installment in what we like to call a multi-year strategic dialogue about the vital trends that will reshape the geography of our planet by 2050. 2050 is an arbitrary date in a somewhat distant future. It's one of those dates where it forces you to think hard outside of your normal planning horizons, outside of your budgeting horizon. You can't even know who's going to be working in your company or at your university uh, in 2050. Um, and it's also kind of a liberating date because we don't expect anybody to get it right. This isn't a predictive exercise. This is an exercise in creative thinking, in a way, to apply your scientific knowledge, your practical knowledge, to understand what those vital trends may be that we need to think about so that as we plan our lives and plan uh, our investments for our society, we can uh, get ahead of the curve. We can say, I know that's a vital trend that's going to do something. I don't know what it's going to do. But we need to invest time and energy and resources in order to get ahead of that curve. So uh, thanks for coming back. This year, we are focused on the future geography of sustainability, of conservation, of restoration, many different ways of thinking about how to live on, frankly, a finite planet in a way that lets us get where we need to be to meet our collective values by 2050. There's only one thing that really won't change by 2050 when it comes to the geography of our planet, right? Plate tectonics are going to move things a couple centimeters. Uh, we won't notice it. 
I can guarantee you by 2050, everything else on the surface of the planet will be different in fundamental ways. And it's our collective responsibility to kind of figure that out. So I want to start with a couple framing issues um, with the first slide. Who's heard the term Anthropocene? Who hasn't heard the term Anthropocene? All right. So geologists have often used the term Holocene uh, to talk about the post-glacial geologic epoch that man has lived in. But there was a moment uh, sometime in uh, mid-19th century where people recognized that man's impact on the Earth was having kind of an irreparable change. Uh, and that term, you know, Holocene, no longer kind of captured the impact of humanity on the Earth's surface. The Anthropocene is a term that these two gentlemen coined, Nobel laureate Paul Crutzen uh, and his colleague Eugene Stormer. Um, and they, we, they realized that humanity was having an inalterable impact so profound that you could actually consider it a geological epoch. So think about that. Uh, millions of years from now, if we're still around, somebody digging in the earth will actually come across a layer, the same way geologists do today about things 65 million years ago. And there will be steel and plastic and all of these things that humanity has created all smushed down through heat and pressure, uh, right? Uh, that assumes, of course, the planet gets there a few million years from now. But there's this notion of the Anthropocene where humanity has had this irreparable impact on the Earth. We just heard Dr. Roger Serra talk about these ecological units as though, you know, in a way we're mapping the natural Earth where humanity is no longer a part. Could we go to the video? So humanity is an interesting thing. I think we're often numb to our impact on the Earth. This was put together by the American Museum of Natural History, released only a couple weeks ago. And this is kind of a story that we've all heard of. We've all watched NOVA. We've all watched National Geographic. Humanity, or proto-humans, started, let's say, a million years ago. 200,000 years ago, started spreading across the Earth's surface. But look at the population. Under a million? That's a pretty small species. What other species had fewer than a million? And that goes until about 10,000 years with the dawn of farming. Humans started actually curating the Earth's surface to serve our own needs. The domestication of food, the domestication of animals. Let's zoom in at zero AD and go from there. It's estimated that the population well, at 1 AD, as it plays, let's just go to 2x on the video. Was actually under 200 million people. You've all seen this story. What's that? Hey, you know, AV happens. Population continued, but the you know, civilization continued, but yet population pretty much hovered. And this goes on and on and on until actually it declines. There's moments where it declines. So we as a species are thinly spread across the entire Earth. Once you hit, let's say, the age of exploration at about 1400, after the bubonic plague, right? So that's one of the declines in the 1300. Uh, you'll watch it dip. 1400, 1492, we actually start exploring the Earth. You'll see kind of spread of the I think it'll be a blue color that spreads. And that has huge ecological impacts. Everybody's heard of the Columbian Exchange, right? The spread of species uh, between the old world and the new. 
But somewhere around 15, 1600, 1700, with the Industrial Revolution, um, people could feed themselves. It was beyond sustenance. We curated this Earth's surface so that we could thrive as a species. And all of a sudden, it goes up. 1900, with the dawn of public health, right? Um, we shoot through the roof. You might call this an invasive species. Think about it, right? So we're now projected to maybe get to 10 billion, maybe get to 11. Uh, I think the rosy projections are 9 billion by 2100. Um, but there's no denying that humans are going to have an undeniable impact, have already had an undeniable impact on the Earth's surface uh, by now. So let's just uh, go to the next slide, if you could. Since I'm a little behind. So think about that. You just saw one measure of the Anthropocene is simply people being everywhere. Lots of people being everywhere. Billions of people being everywhere. Changing, altering the Earth's surface in a way that it's never going to go back. But there's other measures about the Anthropocene. Now, if anybody knows charting uh, and graphing here, um, this is like how to lie with charts, right? Because the units are all different, and there's no x and y axis, or there's no, no y axis. But it's very clear that our water use has gone up. Our waste outputs, like CO2, CO2 is a waste output, has gone up. Like hockey stick, hockey stick gone up, along with our population. People are the cause of these various things, regardless of what the measure is that you choose to use. Next slide. There you go. So Dr. Sayre, in his closing remarks, uh, mentioned E.O. Wilson. Uh, E.O. Wilson could not be with us today. Uh, with his new book, Half Earth, that's out. Um, everybody probably knows E.O. Wilson as one of the world's leading biologists. Uh, he's actually an etymologist, entomologist, um, studied ants, and uh, was the person who really popularized the terms of biodiversity and sustainability. Um, with his new book, as Dr. Sarah pointed out, his belief is that because of the complex interdependencies within ecosystems, which are a geographic entity, you actually, in order to keep those ecosystems from collapsing, uh, will need to carve them out from humanity's footprint, and that that would ultimately amount to half the Earth. A question to you is, is he right? Next slide. Oh, I'll do this. This is a different take on the world's ecosystems, not from what are the ecosystems, but which ones have we as countries and we as a global society come together to choose to protect? Has anybody opened their folder yet that's in their bag? Every one of you have a copy of this, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. These are the actual uh, protected areas as defined by the IUCN and the UN Environmental Program. Together, this is the Protected Areas Database. And EO, in his book, while he made a geographic statement of we must protect half the Earth, he actually never told you what half of the Earth needs to be protected. While he's a biologist with a geographic impulse, he actually is not a geographer, and he didn't define them. But he did reference this data set and pointed out that less than 15% of the Earth's landmass is formally protected, and only 2.5%, 2.8% of the ocean area is protected. So if he's correct, if his thesis is correct that half of the Earth does actually need to be protected, then we're a far cry from that. Uh, if he's wrong, what is the right answer? Does anybody want to guess? I mean, we could do it for like historical posterity's sake. Just shout out. What percentage of the Earth should be protected? I, I don't know, frankly. I, you know, I think this is an open question, uh, and it's super important. In many of the presentations EO uh, has been giving, and in just presentations that people are giving around that topic, they look at these ecosystems. Look how big that is, right? That's very different than that, 
Look at North America, what's formally protected, and what they believe needs to be protected in order to prevent species collapse that would undermine the viability of the human species. Bold statement, right? But th these are the kinds of things they paint. An entire corridor, some might term the Western Wild Way. The, uh, I think it's like the fourth largest forest on Earth, right? But it's being logged and otherwise encroached upon and climate change is having an impact. So these are the types of things that when E.O. Wilson talks about half the Earth, he's talking about large chunks of the Earth. But if you look at the Longleaf Pine Historic Range, people live there. I grew up in the middle of that, right? It is no longer a wilderness. Oops. So to, to take another scholar uh, who is another weirdly a biologist, Jared Diamond uh, started out as uh, in a medical school and then it became an ornithologist, but now teaches in the geography department at UCLA. And his book, Collapse, um, is, a, is a big theme, right? He's looking at the collapse of society through an ecosystem's lens. Uh, and he has many instances of, eco, uh, of, of societal collapse uh, due to uh, ecological uh, collapse. But there are other people who actually question his thesis, and there's a lively debate going on around this. Uh, last year, our theme was urbanization. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about sustainable urban strategies. There was a lot of discussion of a majority of the Earth's population has moved to urban centers. And at this point, uh, it's, it's, it's over 50%. By 2050, the assumption is it'll be around 70%. Uh, in a way, cities are an ecological nightmare, right? New York City has annihilated nature uh, that was here hundreds of years ago. On the other side, society, uh, uh, cities are, in, in a way, society's only hope to have efficient uh, modes of living that, uh, that have less uh, impact on the earth. So there's a bit of a trade. And while cities are kind of a, uh, a scar on the Earth's surface that won't go away, it's a necessary scar if we want to reduce the impact of, of humanity on the global footprint. And we had many pictures last year of all these futurescapes of all these cities. And there are many ideas of how to make uh, these cities more uh, ecological friendly and hopefully allow society to not uh, fully uh, collapse under the weight. Uh, but it's still entirely unclear uh, what conservation strategies, what restoration strategies, what range of sustainability strategies need to be deployed where in order to keep uh, the invasive species of humanity from leading to uh, ecosystem collapse. That's, that's why we don't like invasive species, because they enter ecosystems and lead to ecosystem collapse. Um, and forgive me, but I'm, I'll just call humanity an invasive species for the purpose of this talk, at least. Um, so this is in your bag. I would like everybody to pull it out right now. Um, and I would like you to keep it out for the length of the conference. We have speakers that will be talking about forests. We have speakers who will be talking about the oceans. We have spe uh, speakers who will be talking about our cities. Um, we have many topics that will come out, and a lot of you have smartphones, and you have computers open, and I know you're going to Google things when you hear the speakers talking about it. You know a lot of things in this audience that even our speakers are, are not specialists or experts in. So I would like you, over the course of the next two days, to identify, I don't know, three, five geographies of the Earth that you believe should be protected based upon the knowledge you have, the things you've learned, or the concerns you have. Just draw the polygon, put a number on it, and flip it over, and write a few words. Let us understand where your headspace is. Um, because, and at the bottom of it, I would like you to make your best guess with a little statement as to what percentage of the Earth's surface you believe actually does need to be protected or restored, um, based on what you hear from our speakers today, uh, today and tomorrow, and also everything that you hear uh, anything you can find like uh, on the web or things you've heard previously. And this will be uh, an input into the society's proceedings out of this conference so that we can actually begin the discussion not just of what is protected and how to protect kind of the things on the margin, um, but what is the end state? What is the, uh, the total part of the earth that needs to be protected and in what ways? Um, and then we will collect those at the end 
of the session tomorrow. Um, does that sound good? Can everybody do that? Yes? Yes, excellent. All right, so before uh, we move on, I would like to bring up Dr. Lee Schwartz, the geographer of the United States. Lee? Um, so uh, Lee is not only an AGS counselor, uh, but he's also uh, a, a, a kind of our, our lucky um, rabbit's foot. Um, he's the person in the U.S. government uh, responsible for thinking geographically about at least America's position in the world and all the global issues that we have to deal with. I strongly encourage you to meet Lee uh, before the end of the symposium. Um, but in the spirit of geography, I figured we should let Godus, that's his name, you can tweet it out, hashtag Godus, um, but we'll let Lee uh, kick us off. All right. all right, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Mm -hmm. Am I mic'd? Yes. All right. Good afternoon. Chris, that might be why you didn't get a resounding response this morning um, when you said this morning. Good afternoon. Uh, my job, I think, is to move quickly uh, to get into the, into the guts of uh, today's program because we have a lot of really exciting speakers and uh, we have a lot of uh, really um, talented and, and uh, well-versed people in the audience to contribute, so hopefully we'll get a good dialogue going. I want to congratulate the American Geographical Society, though. Uh, three years ago, this was just an idea that was germinating in a few people's heads, and now I think in many ways this has become the go-to meeting of the year for a lot of people. Uh, the size is right, the dynamism and the energy is outstanding, uh, the talent level every year is different but, but uh, diverse, and uh, John Gould and Jerry Dobson, uh, past officers, John Konarski, Marie, Chris, I think their leadership has really been exceptional. I look forward to the next 34 years of Geography 2050. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Columbia University and the Earth Institute uh, for helping to host this. I actually got my master's and PhD here at Columbia back when there was a geography department at Columbia University. So it's always nice to, to come back here to the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I also want to wish everybody a National Geography Awareness Week, a happy National Geography Awareness Week. I'm sure everybody has been celebrating in their own way. Uh, this was actually signed into law in 1987 by President Reagan when I was a young assistant professor at American University, working closely with Senator Bill Bradley, one of my basketball heroes at the time, uh, to, to raise the uh, the awareness the, 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 to, to make sure that largely we could educate our, our school children and our universities more uh, in geographical awareness. And I think the fact that we had the high school geography teachers here uh, for a mapathon this morning, along with a lot of other activities that were taking place uh, around the country and really around the world. My office uh, last night helped to host a mapathon on HIV AIDS in Kenya and Tanzania, where they were doing household surveys uh, so that they could target prevention strategies. I spoke to a group of Washington, D.C. school children on Tuesday morning playing uh, a geo-plunge card game uh, that has gotten popular uh, throughout the District of Columbia uh, public schools with children and teachers. So there's a lot of energy that's, that's in the air uh, this week and in this room, and I think uh, we should have a very fruitful uh, discussion. Uh, I also want to thank, by the way, Jerry Dobson for providing me with this shirt. For those of you who can't read it, it says Defenders of Geography. There are two shirts like this in the world. Jerry has one in red, I believe, and I have one in black. Um, and uh, Jerry, I had the good fortune of hosting Jerry in my office at the State Department as a Jefferson Science Fellow uh, while he was the president of the AGS. And I also have the good fortune of hosting a current Jefferson Science Fellow, Meredith Gore, who you'll be hearing in the, in the next session as well. Um, so I think if we're looking towards the future, if we're looking towards envisioning a sustainable uh, planet, I think, in my view, the key in many ways is education. Uh, and I think. We're seeing, we're seeing a rise in uh, geographical education in this country. We're seeing a rise in 
geographical awareness around, around the world, and a lot of it is because of the tools and technologies we have so that we now can combine uh, top-down Earth observation with bottom-up Earth observation with participatory mapping and community-based uh, GIS efforts. And I think if the awareness and the education of, of uh, young people, of uh, high school, universities at all levels continues, I think you'll be, we'll, be able to con we'll be able to do a better job of, of, of converting our awareness into action. I remember when uh, there was a campaign in the 19, early 1960s about don't be a litter bug. Uh, it sounds kind of incredulous to think about that today, uh, but uh, just simple messages like that that will circulate uh, around the world, I think, are, are important in order for communities to protect their own environments. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but we still have a lot of inequality in the world today. We, we see education happening in areas of the world uh, that are, are, are wealthier and are able to promote uh, the tools and technologies of our science with ubiquitous cell phone use and other technologies that are becoming available uh, to, to, to people in less developed world. I'm hoping that some of that inequality will help to be bridged, but it's going to take uh, a lot of work and a lot of leadership, and many of the people in this room, I think, can provide that leadership. So I, uh, I welcome you to enjoy the next day and a half. Uh, I, I implore you actually to, to do the task that Chris Tucker set out for you. I know a lot of people come to these meetings and they have tasks to fill out and everybody thinks they're too cool for school and they don't really want to fill it out, but we're counting on you to provide some input uh, in, into this exercise. So, so please take it seriously uh, throughout the course of the next day and a half and, and fill it out and I, I know that will make uh, the AGS happy and enjoy the next uh, day and a half. Thank you very much. And this brings us to our first plenary session, Living Oceans for the Blue Planet. And to help us get this panel started, it's a pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Chip Cunliffe, who has traveled from London to be here with us today. Chip is the director of the Environmental Science Program and Education at XL Catlin, one of the world's most important and growing insurance carriers. Chip, you and your panel are welcome. Um, I am honored, obviously, to be here as a geographer, um, talking to geographers about geography. Um, it's a fantastic um, opportunity and one of the areas, or the area obviously that we're talking about today um, focuses on um, an inspirational um, and indeed a, uh, I suppose, a feature that defines our planet, um, which is obviously the ocean. Um, we have a, a panel of experts um, who will um, sit up here uh, in due course, but in but before that, I'm going to just run through a, a contextualization, I suppose, um, of, of where we're at today. <clears throat> so let me just see if this works. Very good. OK. So I'm sure most of you know that um, the oceans make up 71% of our planet. Um, indeed, they provide 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. Um, it drives the water cycle. Uh, no less, uh, it sustains our ecosystems. It obviously provides food, energy, and a stable climate. Um, and in fact, the list really does go on. Yet, we know um, that the ocean is currently in a state of flux. Um, and we need a healthy ocean to both survive and indeed thrive. So, we believe that there's really an immediate need to accelerate our knowledge of how the oceans are changing to understand how the futurist landscape is changing for society, uh, for business, and for ecosystems into the future. Um, I've just identified a couple of areas and, and, and some pressures that the oceans are con currently um, under. We all know that the Arctic sea ice uh, is melting at a fairly rapid rate. Um, scientists are telling us that potentially there may be no sea ice um, in the Arctic during the summertime by about 2030. Um, Coral reefs are being um, degraded uh, across the world. A quarter have um, been damaged beyond repair. Two-thirds are under threat. Um, and again, scientists are saying that we may lose them all within the next 40 years, which is a, a major worry. Oceans are warming, um, as I'm sure you might be aware. Um, we're likely to see a, between a 1% or, uh, to, sorry, 1 degree to 4 degree increase in temperature 
by the year 2100. More than 93% of the enhanced um, uh, heating since uh, nine, the 1970s has been absorbed by the ocean. We also have overfishing, deoxygen, deoxygenation, which is a subject that um, Dr. Uh, Breitberg will talk about um, in due course. Uh, plastic pollution, uh, certainly the, the Pacific garbage patch, which m some of you may uh, be aware of. Obviously, runoff pollution as well. And indeed, a increasing, or sorry, a decreasing pH um, of the ocean uh, due to CO2 intake as well. So not an insignificant amount of things that are going on um, in this part of the world, um, and indeed um, is something that we need to um, focus on further. Before I introduce um, our panellists, I just want to um, focus on this one last slide. And it really focuses on um, areas of, uh, of I, I suppose, identifying um, players and elements that we need to um, focus on uh, to ensure uh, a sustainable uh, and living ocean. The first of this is evidently to have as much primary science research undertaken as possible. So science is... Um, is key to uh, all of this moving forward. We then have um, our politicians uh, and the need to promote global, national, and indeed um, local policies as related to the oceans as well. And I'm very pleased to have Serge Dedina, um, who's the mayor of Imperial Beach, um, here to talk a little bit more about that. Um, one area that uh, most of you probably won't have thought about um, but is increasingly um, important is bringing in the business side. And I obviously work um, from an insurance company or from an insurance point of view. But obviously there are others um, from a legal, technical and potentially fundraising um, point of view as well where the business community can play its own part. Um, then we have education, not just um, school education, but also educating the masses, educating adults as well as children. Um, we need children, or we need everybody to understand the importance of our oceans. Um, and indeed, uh, one of the things that um, uh, Annika is going to talk about is education. And then last but not least is the advocacy point, um, and where NGOs uh, will help to uh, continue to push this into people's consciousness. So, of course, all of these don't really sit alone. They very much sit together. Uh, they're not siloed in any way, or they shouldn't be siloed in any way. Um, and what, what we're going to do today, or as a panel, um, is discuss all of these different areas um, to, uh, to understand uh, how we can create this living oceans for a blue planet. So without further ado, I'm going to ask um, Denise Breitberg to um, take centre stage. Now, Denise is a senior scientist at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Centre. Um, she heads up the Marine and uh, Estuarine Ecology Lab, which studies the ways that human activities have altered the natural environment. She served on the governing boards of the Association for Sciences um, uh, of Limnology and Oceanography and the Coastal es Estuarine Research um, Federation, and is currently co-chair of the UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission Global Ocean Oxygen Network. Ha ha. So, um, can I introduce uh, Denise to the stage? Thank you so much. So the first slide pretty much sums up the talk. The ocean is losing its breath. It's losing the oxygen on which the uh, ecosystems of the ocean depend and that determines the ways that the ocean can regulate the Earth's climate. Over the last 50 years, uh, over 500 coastal sites have been identified that are low in oxygen. Um, for the natural low oxygen areas in the open ocean have expanded by 4.5 million kilometers. And we're losing, on average, 800 megatons of oxygen per year from the oceans. Uh, if you look at the red dots on this global map, what you can see is that these coastal low oxygen areas occur on every continent in the world. 
and that the lack of dots in a lot of the southern hemisphere and developing countries is actually the lack of monitoring and, and laws that restrict release of data. It doesn't mean that they don't have the problem. Along our coast, the fundamental problem is excess nutrients uh, that come from farmlands, from uh, industry, from air pollution, from human populations. It fertilizes the surface water. Uh, we grow lots of, of algae, and as the algae and animals sink down to the bottom, it's respiration, ironically, the excess of breathing that then is consuming the oxygen as it decays the organic matter. The underlying problem is really pretty simple. If you look at the cumulative number of the increase in the cumulative number of hypoxic systems around the world, uh, it's, a, it's in response to the huge increase in human population over the same period of time, the invention of chemical fertilizers and the application of those in order to feed that increasing human population, and more recently, um, the rapidly increasing temperatures around the globe. And you can see this change over time if you look at a map of a single system. If you look at the Baltic, for example, in the um, turn of the last century, just the very deepest basins at the bottom had low oxygen, about 1,500 kilometers square. In two, by 2012, those low oxygen areas had expanded to 65,000 kilometers square, and the areas that in are in black are completely anoxic, lacking in oxygen. If we look now at the open ocean, and I realize some of this is in very light blue, I hope you can see it, um, over, over the past 50 years, like I said, the uh, ox low oxygen areas have expanded by four and a half million kilometers. That's about the ha half the area of the entire U.S., and the ocean's loss of oxygen is equivalent to about a meter thick layer uh, on the contiguous 48 states, very large amounts. In the open ocean, the primary culprit is warming. Less oxygen can dissolve in warm water. The uh, water is more stratified and that, uh, that prohibits or prevents oxygen from penetrating from the atmosphere. It also affects the ability of the water movement to stir in that low oxygen water. I'm sorry, that highly oxygenated water to the low oxygen areas. Um, if we look at projections of, uh, from the climate change models, whether you're looking at the surface, the kind of mid-depths of, of the open ocean, or closer to the bottom, all of those predictions for the turn of this, for the uh, end of this century are in brown predicting deoxygenation, lower oxygen concentrations. And it's important to remember that that applies to the coasts too. So although we think right now of these coastal areas being affected by local nutrient issues, that warming is affecting them too. Um, and the consequences are pretty simple, right? The American Lung Association probably said it better than anybody else with their old motto which is, if you can't breathe, nothing else matters. Um, it affects physiology, behavior, mortality, changes food webs. It affects the ability of oceans to regulate climate. And um, it ultimately affects human health. Uh, and, and part of the problem is there are feedbacks in the system, too. So um, oh, I do have a well, pointer doesn't really work, but that's OK. If you look over to, to your, your right, um, in the open ocean, as we have increasing global warming, we have increased deoxygenation. The severely oxygen-depleted areas release N2O gas as part of a denitrification process. That's a gas that's got about 300 times the global warming equivalency of carbon dioxide. So more of that then means more warming. In the coasts, as oxygen is very low, we release phosphorus that fuels more production and makes oxygen even lower. So all kinds of really awful things, you know, and you can go on with the gloom and doom message for 
uh, as long as you like. Um, uh, but part of the title of this talk was envisioning 2050. And I'd like to suggest that uh, the area to focus on really is uh, the convergence of the things that can help to restore the ocean's breath and can simultaneously improve human health. Um, if we think about the, the large-scale strategies of what needs to be done, um, we need to reduce nutrients, reduce greenhouse gases, and in the meantime, we need to figure out how to manage our resources to take into account the consequences of declining oxygen. But what does that really mean? So reducing nutrients oops, means improved sanitation agri and agricultural efficiency and air quality. All good things for people, right? Uh, reducing greenhouse gases means avoiding the human consequences also of rising temperatures and rising seas. And the things to do in the meantime mean managing fisheries, including aquaculture, more sustainably. Um, a sustainable Earth would not only have more oxygen in the oceans, but also fewer deaths and less disease due to poor sanitation. Right now in the world, one in three people, sorry, yeah, one in three people, it's 2.4 billion people are still without sanitation facilities. Um, if we look at what that meant in uh, the now developed world in Europe uh, or uh, close to here in the Delaware River uh, estuary, uh, um, during the 1800s and uh, 1900s. Um, but th these are some data from the Thames. And what you can see is that uh, back in the 1950s even, there was absolutely no oxygen in about 50 kilometers of the Thames River. All it took to get just a little bit of oxygen into that river was primary treatment, which really meant not dumping the biosolids, the sewage sludge, directly into the water. And that little bit of oxygen, which also means sanita better sanitation from people, for people was enough to go from only one species of fish, just eels in the river, up to about 60. So good for ocean health, good for human health. Uh, in a sustainable future, or hopefully uh, not too far in the future, we can create jobs to upgrade and replace aging infrastructure and to help the oceans regain, regain their breath. Combined sewer overflow is a very polite term for saying that when we have storms in Chesapeake Bay or in New York or in lots of places with aging infrastructure, we're going back in time to the, the Thames and Delaware River of the 1800s and early 1900s. In Baltimore, for example, just a single severe rainstorm can result in 12 million gal gallons of combined sewage overflow directly into uh, waterways feeding into Chesapeake Bay. A sustainable future uh, will also have improved air quality. That would reduce nutrient loads to estuaries, which would help with the oxygen problem, um, but it also helps respiratory problems in people. Uh, about a third of the nitrogen now going into Chesapeake Bay uh, is from nitrogen oxide uh, atmospheric deposition. Um, and what we're finding is that the region-wide starts of improvements in water quality that we're seeing in Chesapeake Bay are actually a function of reduced NOx emissions from actions mandated uh, through, because of the Clean Air Act. Um, a sustainable planet. Uh, would have improved agricultural practices that support ocean oxygen, but also support food security and human health. If we look at Shenzhen uh, in Hong Kong, what you can see is in spite of incredibly explosive increases in human population from a small town up to uh, a metropolis of about 11 million people, uh, oxygen concentrations were declining, but in spite of that, they were able to put into place practices that then resulted in a rebound in oxygen. Uh, and a lot of this had to do with beginning to treat animal waste in the same way 
as human waste instead of allowing it to be released into waterways. Um, a sustainable future uh, ocean would be the, the site of sustainable aquaculture that supports food security, livelihoods, and economies, as well as ocean health. Because if we don't do aquaculture in a sustainable way, um, aquaculture, fish aquaculture itself can deplete oxygen. Uh, and the consequences when it does are lost wages, lost food, and when the local populations can't afford to simply throw out the fish killed by low oxygen, histamine seafood poisoning. And instead, shellfish aquaculture in particular can actually be used to filter water and improve uh, oxygen and ocean health. And finally, regaining the ocean's breath in a sustainable future requires reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Botswana, for example, uh, has a goal to be an energy exporter by 2018. A lot of developing countries are essentially leapfrogging some of the technology that, uh, and, and dependence on fossil fuels that we are struggling with. Reducing global uh, greenhouse gas emissions means more oxygen in the ocean, but it also means less human dislocation and suffering due to loss of drinking water uh, as glaciers melt, crop failures, and the whole litany of problems associated with global warming that we all know. And, and finally, uh, in a sustainable future ocean, we manage fisheries to protect from effects of low oxygen and benefit human nutrition and economies. One thing that, um, as a, a marine ecologist, I think about is where the animals in the oceans escape to, to avoid some of the problems we cause, and whether those need to be protected. So the take-home message, then, that I'd like to leave you with um, is that the ocean can regain its breath and that we don't necessarily have to be focused, have to be um, struggling with, with conflicts between strategies that help people and strategies that help the environment, but instead solutions for the ocean can benefit human populations on land. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like now to introduce you to Dr. Serge Dedina. Um, he's the mayor of Imperial Beach in California and also the executive director of Wild Coast, an international conservation um, team that conserves coastal and marine ecos ecosystems and wildlife. As mayor, um, Dr. Dedina is leading the effort to carry out sea level rise adaptation planning in Imperial Beach. And through, his, and through Wild Coast, he's helping to lead the effort to manage the state system for marine protected areas. And I'd like to obviously uh, invite uh, Dr. Dodina to talk to you a little bit further about those two elements. First of all, uh, thanks everybody for being here. And by the way, if you're a geographer, you are among the coolest of all academic disciplines that does super amazingly awesome applied conservation work. So um, yeah, give yourselves a hand. I was actually at my Ex high school where I'm in the town that I'm the mayor of the other day and it was I did a proclamation for geography awareness week which was great with kids that were doing applied geography in my in my city and the people from our school district and um, and got to see some of the great work the kids are doing and acknowledge that for those of you who are teachers it's more important than ever to get kids out in the field and actually doing applied things going out and talking to people going out and seeing things, going out and making, reaching conclusions and reporting them and making connections. And these kids had done something on burkinis, and the burkini issue in France, but that allowed, because I'm in a beach, a very diverse beach community, with a lot of immigrants on the U.S.-Mexico border to talk about, well, who uses our beach? Who uses wetsuits that look like burkinis, right? What about the Mennonites that come to our beach because they're getting medical care in Mexico and go on the beach with their clothes on or the Mexican... Immigrants that go in the water with all their clothes in because they come from modest areas in Mexico. So really great to see that. So thank you for all the work you're doing. Thanks, Dr. Price, for the invite to be here. And I'll shout out to my buddy Dave Kaplan, who we are in grad school. Dave, where are you? Raise your hand. Are you here? There you go. There. We were in grad school 27 years ago, so it's great to see you. So uh, these are friendly sea turtles on the coast of Oaxaca and talk to you a little bit about what we're doing to save these and 
ecosystems. Fortunately, Dr. Sayer, who's one of my conservation gurus and I worked with uh, almost 20 years ago at the Nature Conservancy, now talked about EMU, so I feel like I'm not even irrelevant anymore, but I took a photo of his map and the, the uh, URL and sent that to my team. So talk to you a little bit about the work we're doing on ecosystem conservation and some of the tools for saving the ocean that's working, and then number two, some of the work we're doing on sea level rise. So I'm also the mayor of Imperial Beach, California, like I said, on the, on the last town of the California coast. 2,500 acres surrounded by 17,000 acres of protected areas, including the Pacific Ocean. But um, we're really taking the lead in California under our wonderful governor, Dr. Jerry, I'm mean, not Dr. Jerry Brown, Governor Jerry Brown. And climate's a big deal in California. And, you know, my argument is if your city on the coast isn't already dealing with sea level rise, it might be a little too late. You better get, you better get ahead of it now. So that's something I'll go back to. But um, as you can see, we're surrounded on three sides. So being a geographer as mayor and doing conservation, it's a very great thing to do. But we can serve coastal marine ecosystems and wildlife, it's places like this in, in the Sea of Cortez. Um, and looking at ways to, and Dr. Sayre and, and his team at the TNC and folks, his colleagues at CI and the World Wildlife Fund have done these amazing maps of ecoregions and ecosystems around the world. Mangroves uh, are among the most carbon sequestering plants on, on the planet, and we're learning that mangroves in desert areas, like in Baja, are among the top sequesters of carbon. So understanding how to conserve those is critical. Uh, coral reefs. Chip's working and his company's working on helping d map and, and get data about coral reefs globally. That's super important er things to do. Um, someone's going to talk after us about these amazing animals, uh, sharks, for example. But uh, Dr. Plopper's here who's talking about tomorrow about, she was originated this cold concept of buffalo commons. Well, you really, when you think about the ocean, you need shark commons. Sharks are in integral parts of the ocean. Um, and, you know, when we think about ocean conservation, we're linking ecosystems and ecoregions. And I was talking to somebody recently who's looking at leatherback turtles, and he's thinking of the ocean as a giant turtle corridor. So how do you link the areas in Costa Rica where leatherback turtles are to the Monterey Bay uh, marine sanctuary where turtles go and feed on jellyfish from Indonesia, right? Like, how do you make, how do you make those linkages? And giant wildlife are, are really the way to think about that. And then, you know, so why should we care about the ocean, right? Like, and, you know, we're getting away from just biodiversity as something that's important, like as if someone in uh, Iowa should just care about biodiversity or even in California and starting to think a little bit more selfish, utilitarian terms. And, but, you know, the reality is the ocean's a, a pretty amazingly beautiful, complex place that ultimately makes us better as a society. And frankly, when you come in contact with friendly gray whales, it makes your life a lot better. And Wallace J. Nichols, who's written a book called Blue Mind, um, on the New York Times bestseller list now uh, for in nature books, and I, who I've started Wild Coast with, really talks about having contact with water is really good for us uh, psychologically. So anyway, um, my kids surf, I surf. You know, there's, uh, I know that I don't schedule any meetings before nine in the morning because I know that if I get in the water every day and talk to my people and have contact with the ocean, everything else seems pretty easy, actually, especially when the surf was really big like it was a few days ago. People sail. Sailors have become advocates for ocean conservation. The guys sailing, men and women sailing around the world are seeing the plastics in the ocean. They're understanding they have to take a role in connecting sailors with conservationists, with advocates and policy. That's been really powerful. Uh, people diving are really, divers are on the cutting edge of really advocating for conservation, just like hunters and, and fishermen are in the American West. And then finally, you know, uh, I learned from a whole range of geographers encapsulated by uh, people like Dr. Peter Hurley, Hurley and his colleagues who really talked about the importance of, of people in ecosystems. If you do international marine conservation, you ain't getting rid of fishermen. You're not talking about eliminating fishing. You're talking about sustainable fishing practices and the ethics and morality of making sure that the most impoverished people who live on the edge of the ocean and have nothing except nets um, and no GPSs and outboard motors have a way of working sustainably um, and more importantly, understanding their role in being stewards and advocates for ocean conservation. And frankly, many of them are working in 19th century fishing technologies and connecting them with the global marketplace and making sure they have access to, to, uh, to markets to actually sell their sustainable products. This is in Magdalena Bay where they get these giant fan scallops that 
You know, they're just going down to the bottom of the sand and, and pulling out fan scallops with hooks. If you want to do conservation, it's a pretty good place to start. They're not having much of an impact on the ecosystem. But frankly, there are problems. This is the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and, you know, the, deal, the issue with plastic and waste tires and sewage um, and, uh, is, is a huge problem. And finally, climate change. The oceans are changing, the climate's changing, and that's having a big impact on ecosystems. So um, this is why I'm doing sea level rise as mayor, okay? It's not about sea level rise, it's about coastal flooding, right? The coastal flooding and sea level, sea level rise is already happening. I don't have to tell folks in New York about that. Um, and so that's something we have to deal with. We have to deal with now. We have to deal with it calmly and strategically and in a real science-based way. I'm really proud that my next public works director, a kid with a master's from Santa Barbara, environmental science, is going to be my public works director because we know that managing cities now is not about what's in the city. It's about what's in the city and what's coming at you, right? And that's something we're all going to think, have to think about. But I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tools we using in California for ocean conservation. Got some folks following me talking about sharks. But in California, we've articulated a vision for protecting our ocean and restoring our ocean that's involved, it's involved a system of 500,000 acres of marine protected areas. It's one of the largest science-based networks of marine protected areas in the world. And uh, that's been in existence about 10 years now in different parts of the state, five years in Southern California. And we realize that by connecting these areas um, off the coast and protecting key fisheries reproduction areas and key uh, eco marine ecosystems. We're going to have a more productive economy, a more resilient coastline, and a happier society, right? Because we'll be, uh, we'll be connected to these ocean areas. So that's something we're doing. It, we really think it takes nine to 10 years to bring back the ocean. After five years in Southern California, we're starting to see the fish come back. Central California, they are. Marine conservation areas or marine protected areas do work. And that's what's really cool. We can restore the ocean. So really proud of being in California. And you know, people like Enric Sala and Jeremy Jackson and, uh, are, have been talking about the importance of saving areas where you're fish spawning, but where you get big fish. We need big fish in the ocean. So that's something we're doing in California. And now we're looking at doing more offshore stuff. Um, and I had a whole team in place talking about doing a federal marine sanctuary with the Clinton administration, but obviously that's changed. So uh, we'll be reevaluating our federal marine ocean policy. Um, and then really identifying where you get these wildlife spectacles, whether it's sea turtle or revilus, or in the case of La Jolla, um, we have all these schools of leopard sharks, really amazing. And it's amazing to see um, them in that area. And then finally in California, if we only communicate with a bunch of wealthy BMW drive-in Hollywood celebrity mansion living coastal dwellers about ocean conservation, we are not going to have an ocean conservation movement. If we're not taking kids from the inner cities and underserved areas and making sure that everybody in America has access to a healthy coast and ocean, um, we're not doing our job. And it's really important to make sure that kids get outside and on the beach. New York was our great national melting pot, but beaches, Southern California beaches are a great melting pot in Southern California, amazingly diverse happy places, and we're making sure we get immigrant kids out on marine protected areas. We're making sure that we're taking kids from tribal communities in San Diego County. We actually have uh, the highest number of tribes of any county in the, in the country, in San Diego, and they used to own everything on the coastline, including in the, villa, in the areas that were now underwater because of sea level rise. So very happy, interesting partnership in getting those kids out on the water doing science, and it's something we're going to continue to do. And I'm very proud that we have a state that we're fundamentally having access to the coast is something that's enshrined in the California Coastal Act, and I, we fight for all the time. Um, and then some of the things in Mexico, um, this is actually an island off the U.S.-Mexico border, the Coronado Islands. It forms a chain of islands down the Baja Coast. We hope that President Peña Nieto will declare this a uh, marine protected area or part of a national park of Pacific Islands to connect with California's protected islands really soon. Um, we're looking at, and we're doing, coastal conservation concessions. So we're working with Mexico's National Park Service and mapping the mean, 60 feet above the mean high tide line, and then mapping mangroves, and then actually getting, working with the National Park Service in Mexico 
to get concessions to those areas for conservation for things like ecosystem services, storm prevention, sea level rise adaptation, uh, and biodiversity conservation. So a really interesting partnership. We just got 120 miles of those in Baja's Magdalena Bay, 3,000 acres of mangroves, and it's a very GIS intensive, remote sensing based uh, me field methodology, very interesting, but really, really kind of cutting edge and innovative. If you can't do national parks, you need to figure out every tool you can use to conserve the ocean. Uh, and really cool that these areas are where gray whales go. Um, and really, the idea of indigenous reserves, where these sea turtles nest is owned by the Chontal people in Oaxaca. So we're working with those communities in their indigenous reserves to actually figure out how to get them involved in sea turtle management and conservation. And then, uh, finally, the reason we know that MPAs work is that in Cabo Pomo, in southern Baja, it's a 17,000 acre marine reserve and coral reef, um, where you have whale sharks and schools of sharks. 15 years ago, it was actually 20 years ago when I was in the Nature Conservancy, that area was declared a national park. Um, and fishermen and scientists got together to make it a no-take zone. All right, fishermen who literally have nothing decided to give up fishing. Very uh, heroic act. And so 15 years later, Scripps went out with Mexican scientists the Scripps Institution of Oceanography scientists, and did some research on, on the result. And the result was that fish biomass increased 460%. If you go there now, it's Cabo Pulmo National Park, two hours um, east of San Jose, or Cabo San Lucas. You can fly there from New York. Um, you should go there if you like to dive. It's the Jurassic Park of the ocean. Literally amazing. And we're now, you know, so that's our proof that this isn't gobbledygook what we're talking about. You can save the ocean, you can restore ecosystems, and it works. And we use this model when we got ecosystems, or MPAs declared in California. And then finally, um, a lot of us are really happy that the U.S. has reopened relationships with, with Cuba. Um, I was in the field in Cuba uh, last summer when NOAA was uh, initiating its negotiations with Cuba to have an MOU on ocean conservation in the Gulf of Mexico because the folks at NOAA recognize that the ecosystem services that the Cuba provides um, really, really support the fisheries and coastal economy of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so there's something to be said for not having a functioning economy, um, at least, or any boats or any fishing. Uh, Cuba reminds me of Mexico 30 years ago in terms of its ocean resources and amazingly well-preserved um, ecosystems, and so we're working with the Cuban government to assist in the management of coral reefs there. We just had a team of um, television folks filming some of their success stories, but they also have um, some of the world's most successful marine reserves, Jardines de la Reina, which is in southern Cuba, uh, sort of off in the ocean. It's just an amazing area and really sh shows the promise that, you know, we can get it right. We understand how to do the right thing with the right maps, with the right science, smart politics that brings people together, that eliminates some of the jargon and buzzword, but more importantly, understanding that the more we engage people in the field and getting them outdoors to experience these things, whether or not they're a president or they're a senator or a congressman or a fisherman or a coal miner's kid or whatever, the more successful we have, the happier we'll be, and more importantly, the more we're gonna have a living, vibrant ocean. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to segue now into um, a, an area of, uh, that in fact, almost everybody um, has been talking about today, um, and doubtless will do tomorrow as well, but is education. Um, I'd like to introduce Annika Ballant, who's the Director of Education at Al Galita Marine Research and Education. Her bachelor's degree focused on marine plastic pollution. She's joined Al Galita um, to communicate the important issue um, to a range of stakeholders. Um, she's also been part of a research team processing gyre, gyre, gyre samples, should I say, and sampling plastics and fish from the Pacific Ocean. Her presentation today focuses on the real need to create a circular economy alongside identifying the importance of education across sectors. Thanks. Watch out. 
All right, good morning, everybody. I'm going to continue our discussion of the future geography of our oceans by bringing the focus to plastics pollution. This is the closing. Oh, <laughs> or are you doing? Okay. Can you go back? All right. <laughs> Okay, so the plastics pollution issue is a truly multiple, multidisciplinary issue um, in that it will require collaboration from policy, policy makers, educators, scientists, and industry leaders um, to really change our relationship to plastics, and um, this will allow for us to create a sustainable ocean um, as well. So at Algalita, which is a nonprofit based in uh, Long Beach, California, we have three main goals. The first and foremost goal is to learn about the issue of plastics pollution through research, primarily through expeditions. Currently, um, our crew is out heading towards the Galapagos Islands on a seven-month expedition um, to investigate plastics in the equator and in the South Pacific Ocean and really understand the relationship to, with, between plastics and lanternfish, which are the most abundant fish by biomass. Um, and which are at the bottom of the food chain. So there's still a lot to understand about the issue, but we already have a lot of information that we can uh, work off of and to start to change uh, our society and relationship to plastics. Our second goal is to educate. Um, we focus on youth because these are the people that are going to be leading our future in 2050 um, and continuing the progress that we're starting here and lastly, we are a collaboration platform for many different groups, universities, between other nonprofits, schools, and policy and industry as well. This is a video we'll be able to play. <laughs> Anyways, um, so this is a video of me sorting through a plastic sample. Um, a sediment sample from the Great Lakes, where I did my master's research looking at plastics in the sediments. Um, and I was hoping to point out the scale of the issue is often very hard to understand because it's composed of these very small fragments. You can see the scale in the upper right-hand corner. Um, looking at and trying to distinguish plastics from other natural materials is often quite difficult. If you're looking at it in the microscope, uh, it's often very difficult to determine whether what you're looking at is a naturally occurring a material or if it's man-made. And a lot of times, uh, we need to use further investigations using chemical uh, techniques to I really identify and pick out the plastics from other materials. Um, and yet, because, even though these pieces are so small, they cover our world over through the oceans and on ter in terrestrial areas. So the uh, scale of the plastics issue is growing rapidly together with population increases um, and with our demand for this very convenient material that seems to solve all of our problems. Um, and in 2010, it was estimated, or after 2010, it was estimated that in 2010, uh, about 8 million metric tons of plastic had entered the ocean from coastal regions. Um, and as I'll discuss further, probably in the panel discussion, this plastic is mostly coming from land sources, and not only just from coastal communities. It's coming from everywhere on land, because the ocean is downhill from everywhere, and everywhere on land is connected to the oceans through tributaries, storm drains, etc. So most of the people, uh, when I really get to talk with, with people one-on-one, -on -one, uh, have the preconception that what we find out in the ocean is composed of large debris, like plastic bottles, utensils, cups, buoys, that kind of thing. But really what we find uh, when we go out there is what we call plastic soup. And this is kind of like a confetti mixture between plastic and what should be in the surface of the ocean, which is lots of plankton and other organisms. So the, compri uh, the combined data from over 20 expeditions, oceanic expeditions, was used by a working group led by Dr. Marcus Erickson of Five Gyres 
to produce this model of the global distribution of plastics in our surface waters. And they looked at all different uh, size ranges of plastics from those microplastics smaller than one millimeter to larger objects. And conclusion that they came, to, uh, came up with were that these small plastics are what are really most abundant and that they're collecting in our coastal and uh, subtropical zones. So plastics aren't only affecting the surface waters, but are found throughout the water column, as well as in our sediments and in our coastal regions. This is a picture of what has been termed plastiglomerate, a new kind of rock, which is formed from the fusion of natural sediments together with molten plastic uh, during uh, anthropogenic activities, like burning debris on beaches. While well, this sample was collected in, uh, on Camillo Beach in Hawaii, um, this is likely going to be found more commonly throughout our world as people start using waste plastic as fuel and or in terms of uh, waste management and incineration of waste. So plastics um, are generally most interesting in terms of their biological effects. We know that they're everywhere, but how are they actually affecting humans? And how are they affecting our food chain? Well, there's lots of research that shows that plastic is harming all sorts of marine organisms and terrestrial organisms through ingestion of plastics and entanglement. So those um, plastics that are ingested, while they're not uh, in themselves toxic generally, they're actually inert, as most plastic is, um, but they act as sponges for other toxins onto their surfaces um, because they're both hydrophobic materials. Generally, plastic is a petroleum product, and um, a lot of the other toxic chemicals in our environment, like PCBs and DDT and other metals, will stick to the surface of the plastics and possibly act as a toxic pill to these organisms that are ingesting it. Not only that, plastics act as uh, rafting systems to spread invasive species um, around the globe, uh, and they can also host uh, assemblages of harmful bacteria. So plastics, because of the size range that they can uh, occur in from the nanometer scale to meter scale, can be ingested by uh, organisms of all trophic levels. And most astoundingly to me is the fact that um, these Plastics can harm multiple generations of organisms. You see this is a, a decaying carcass of an albatross on Midway Island. Its guts are full of plastics, um, which is likely the cause for its death. And these plastics are going to remain in the environment long after this bird has decayed, and another bird or another organism can ingest it. So it's a, it, plastics act on a different time scale than is easy for us to measure. Plastics production has increased uh, exponentially since the 1950s when it was first started to use be used commercially. And it is closely tied to the oil industry um, because plastics are generally made from oil. So reversing this trend is going to require that we change our relationship to plastics, how we look at it as a material, uh, change the way we think of it as a disposable material, um, and it's going to require change on a system-wide scale uh, in our economy and um, in how um, we approach plastics as a material for products that we're producing. So getting into the education uh, and solution in the future of plastics, at the base of this transition to a more sustainable future uh, is going to be getting everyone to understand and care about the issue, at least uh, a bit. And while it's easy to get those coastal communities um, involved in the issue, it's much harder to reach those that are inland and aren't actually viewing the, the harm that plastic is doing, and they're not seeing it on our coastlines. Um, so that's how do we approach those, those groups. So at Algalida, we have many different education programs um, from kits that we send out to schools, presentations, um, 
and we focus most of our education on STEM using plastics as a way to teach these other topics, and that's a way that we can actually get it into the classrooms. Um, in America, at least, we have lots of, teachers have to meet a lot of standards, and so we're trying to use plastics as a medium to teach about these other topics. Because it's such a disciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary issue, we have the ability to do that. We also uh, provide many hands-on research opportunities for students. Uh, we're in, they're in our lab, but also on our research vessel. And our reach is global. Um, this is a map of the participants of our interactive uh, blog that we have, where students get to communicate with the crew and scientists on board of our expeditions and ask questions about what they're doing, learn about the day-to-day -day life, and really get to be there um, virtually. We also have an international youth summit every year um, where students from uh, many different countries come together, not unlike this weekend or the, these two days here, to discuss plastics. And we use it as a tool to give them the means and the tools to, uh, ch uh, to work on their own solution to plastics pollution um, in their local communities when they go back home at the end of the weekend. So at Algalito, we really focus on prevention because we believe that's the most uh, currently feasible and most important uh, solution on an individual level. Um, however, in a large picture, which is where we're focusing to, um, these next few days, is on a systems-wide scale. And in terms of this, in our relationship to plastics, we need to transition to a circular economy where, as the um, World Economic Forum reported, um, and this is an economy that uh, reduces our connection to oil and improves our uh, recycling ability, reduce the amount of virgin plastics that are produced, and really think about plastics or product design and ways that we can sustainably design products. So there are a few examples of partnerships that are already happening between uh, industry and NGOs. For example, FC Bayern Munich and Adidas are working together with a liaison uh, organization called Parley um, to create these new products out of recovered uh, marine debris. And while it's a very uh, attractive solution, maybe it's not the right solution. If you've heard of the microfiber issue and how microfibers are um, one of the, they're actually one of the most abundant types of microplastics in the oceans, and they're coming mainly from the washing of clothing. So there's always going to be the next problem to look at, um, and really going to the base of the issue is going to be necessary. So in terms of product design, we need to look, we need to make sure that our new products, especially when they're incorporating plastics, are reusable, recyclable, recoverable, and repairable. And to finish, I'd just like to um, point out a few of the organizations that are already working together on this issue. Um, if there are any, um, and I'm sure this, will, this group will grow further, but I just wanted to conclude with the um, stating that these organizations are really going to be the glue that are, um, and the fuel for this transition to a circular economy. So thank you very much. Okay, um, so whilst they're just um, fiddling around with the presentation, um, uh, I manage Excel Catlin's um, Ocean Science Research Communication and Education programs. Um, we are a specialty uh, insurer and reinsurer uh, based in Bermuda, but we have offices in about 60 countries around the world. And part of my job is also to communicate internally and externally about how climate change will impact the futurist landscape. Um, we what, I suppose some of you may be thinking, well, why is an insurance company or reinsurance company actually part of this um, at all? And one of the things that we see or are seeing is that the oceans could well be, or may well be, the greatest driver of change to the future risk landscape. Um, and as an insurance company, we need to be aware of this, not only for ourselves, but also um, for our clients, um, businesses around the world, and uh, each one of us as well. What I'm going to ask 
what I'm going to do first of all, however, is just show you a, a quick video um, to hopefully help, um, help contextualize the work that we've been doing over the last eight years or so. Well, there we go. That's uh, a little bit of an intro, intro to, uh, to the next couple of minutes or so. I'm just going to wait for these guys to bring the, uh, my presentation back on screen. There we go. Perfect. So for the last eight years or so since 2009, XL Catlin, or Catlin as, as it was then, now XL Catlin, have uh, been undertaking um, uh, primary ration research um, in three key indicators of, of change. Firstly, in sea ice loss. Um, secondly, in coral reef health. And most recently, um, on the deep ocean habitats. Um, uh, around uh, Canada and Bermuda. Um, in 2009, we took a team of uh, three uh, explorers onto the Arctic Ocean, uh, dropped them up there during the winter sp spring transition, uh, which is a time which, uh, as you can well imagine, it's pretty cold, so minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and obviously colder with uh, wind chill. Um, they were undertaking to collect snow and ice data um, to better understand uh, when there will be no um, ice uh, on top of the Arctic Ocean uh, during the summertime. In, 20, in 2010, we also sent a, uh, a team of scientists up onto the ice, um, and they focused uh, their research on ocean acidification. And then in 2011, we spent, uh, or they spent uh, another uh, season uh, collecting data um, focused on what's called the thermohaline destabilization, so how sea Arctic sea ice loss may impact ocean currents in the future. Um, for the last um, five years or so, so since 2012 um, and indeed ongoing, um, we have been uh, working on something called the Excel Catlin Seaview Survey. It is a collaboration of uh, major organizations, companies, um, NGOs and others um, to create um, the most comprehensive digital survey of coral reef health around the world. Um, so far, we have um, undertaken uh, 1,200, 1, oh, sorry, 1,200 kilometres um, of reefscapes um, around the world, around 26 different countries. Um, and indeed, the, the work that these guys are doing, or we are doing, um, is uh, 30 times quicker um, than traditional techniques. So us as a business who have put money into creating and pushing this all forward... I think is really quite interesting and indeed exciting for the scientific community. But you may be thinking, well, why again is an insurance company involved in coral reef health? Well, it's, there's, I suppose, an obvious answer in that reefs provide protection on, to land. Um, they dissipate up to 90% of a wave's energy. 
Um, and if you have insured assets on land and um, the coral reefs are dying um, and all being um, taken out by various pressures, then we're likely to see um, a different type of risk um, in the future. So it's very much um, a forward, we are very much a forward thinking company uh, as regard these types of things. Um, this summer we undertook uh, an expedition to uh, Bermuda um, with the XL Catlin Deep Ocean Survey, um, which basically looked to um, undertake uh, an un or to understand better the health and resilience of the deep ocean. Again, a key indicator of change um, for our world. We've mapped new areas of seabed between Canada and Bermuda. We've come across new, uh, uh, new species, we believe, um, and indeed we've undertaken about 400 submarine hours underwater, 450 um, sampling dives, um, 65 science dives, and more. So those are the, the, the kind of um, expeditions that we've been funding um, for the last um, eight years or so. But what's hugely important for us is not just uh, we keep the data. The data is very much um, out in the public view. Um, but we want to communicate as far and wide as we possibly can. So in every instance and in every expedition or every part of an expedition, we work with a broadcast partner and or other partners um, to communicate um, the work that we are undertaking. Um, indeed, part of the, the work that we've been doing um, with, uh, on the coral reefs have been working with Google um, and you can now dive the Great Barrier Reef, the Galapagos Islands, um, off the coast of Florida, wherever you want, really, um, on Google Street View. So all those images are now, um, are now free to use and utilize, and indeed part of our work in an uh, in education sense um, utilizes those as well. For us as a, as a company, we, see, we need to see um, impact from the work that we are undertaking. So yes, we are undertaking this um, as primary research. We look to see um, peer-reviewed papers um, in as many journals as we possibly can. Seven peer-reviewed peer, um, uh, peer um, uh, sorry papers in from the Arctic. Ten so far from the Sea View Survey. Another twenty in Train, and doubtless uh, many more from the Deep Ocean as well. So again, we're, we're looking to, to ensure that we're pushing that science forward. <clears throat> Part of our legacy and a critical element of what we are doing is, is to communicate and educate um, a, younger, uh, a younger population. We want to create an ocean literate population or open ocean literate generation. I was a geography teacher at one point or other um, and only 10 years ago there was nothing in the curriculum uh, that focused on the oceans. So working alongside uh, my colleagues here on the panel and doubtless other, many others as well, um, we are looking to undertake this as a, as a critical um, part of the work. <clears throat> one of the things, <clears throat> although it doesn't actually say it on there, that we've um, coined, or one of the terms we've coined over the last um, couple of years, um, is this term ocean risk. So understanding how the oceans are changing and how that will impact risk in the future. You can see here a, a, a map of the world, um, and you can see that the, it's pretty much covered in pink and or dark red. Um, so we're actually looking at either warmer than average or record warmest um, temperature percentiles between January and September of this year. Now, ocean warming is something that we as a, as a business um, are very keen to understand further um, because of the various elements that you can see here on the right-hand side. Ocean warming will have an impact on storm intensity. We're looking at um, increased storm intensities uh, along the eastern seaboard of the US um, as the century wears on. We're al already seeing fairly um, intense storms off the coast of the Philippines, 185 and 195 miles an hour um, were the two hurricanes or typhoons that have hit the Philippines over the last couple of years. <clears throat> One of the consequences of ocean warming is also sea level rise, um, as Serge has already uh, indicated. Um, you put those two things together, so in intensity of storms and sea level rise, the likelihood of increased flooding um, or flooding increases. Um, we also have food security issues. Fish are now moving north and south um, to get away or to, to move into cooler waters. For those people who rely on fish, um, uh, that is quite an important um, area. Obviously, we have sea ice losses we've already discussed. 
And one of the things that we haven't really touched on today, um, it's quite se slightly separate from ocean warming, is ocean acidification as well. So various things that we, um, as, a, as an insurance company, are keen to understand more about. One of the things that we did, um, uh, we've worked on with the IUCN, um, and in fact was uh, um, published in uh, September at the Hawaii conference, was this um, report on ocean warming. It's about 500 pages long. Um, we part funded this, um, but it's really a case of getting this again into people's consciousness um, and across people's uh, desks. <clears throat> I think that um, the work that we are all doing, um, and indeed um, we will continue to do over the next uh, few years, will be hugely important for our oceans and our oceans community. And I'd like to take the opportunity now to invite our panel um, back to the stage to undertake a, uh, about 10 or 15 minutes worth of a, a panel session before we um, open the uh, floor up for discussion and questions from you guys. <clears throat> I want to start with science because that's what, what underpins all of this. Um, and I think that because of the, the importance um, of uh, science, how do we ensure that um, the oceans continue to either stay on the agenda of the politicians and or pushes it up the agenda? And I'll, I'll ask the, the, the question to Denise first. So I, I guess there are three... Um Three things that I think are really critically important. Um, one is, to some extent, changing the reward system for scientists. Uh, I, I, I think almost all of us want to see an impact of our work beyond getting publications in journals. Um, but the reward system for tenure and, and so forth doesn't always fully recognize the value um, of the other kinds of outreach work that we can do. Um, another thing is actual training in working with the media um, and communication. Um, there are groups uh, in the US, for example, something called Compass that directly connects um, researchers they, um, and good target audiences. They set up congressional briefings. They do um, communication training workshops where they bring together scientists and really top-level journalists from the US and, and elsewhere um, and really help people learn how to communicate but also give them the vehicles for getting their message out. And, and I think then the final leg of it is, or were an additional leg, I'm sure there are lots of other uh, things that are important, is I think within our K-12 education system, teaching our young people as they're growing up about what science can bring to the table. I, I think sometimes science is taught as a bunch of facts um, and, not, and, and the value of what science has brought to society and how it can help solve problems is not uh, something that, that is really uh, incorporated into our educational system. So do you have anything to, to add? Um, I mean, basically, I, mean, I know that you, you, you sit as, as part of um, policy or government I mean, in, in, in your own way. How do you, um, and, and I think that being passionate about it is, is one thing, but how do you see um, us being able to continue to push this up the agenda? You, you know, and one, one thing, is it, this is on, right? It is now. One thing that's really important is there's a real new, new emphasis on STEM and then STEAM. Getting these kids trained in science and working in the field, getting them into universities with scholarships. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that we got two women who work for me, NAUS fellowships, um, to then go after they got their master's degrees at Santa Barbara and Scripps to go work in Washington. And I have a woman who grew up on the U.S. Mexico border that's now working for Senator Cory Booker uh, doing uh, ocean. Uh, conservation work for or policy work for him, so that's really important. Number two, we, we all of us who work in these fields have to get into positions on committees and boards where we have the opportunity to use our scientific and educational background to really inform policy. It's really important. The science can't drive everything, but science has to have, a, we have, to have an underpinning of science, or more importantly, the capacity to communicate science effectively. And that goes back to also, whether you're a geographer or a scientist, it's, this training in communications is so critical. Like the scientists 
who are able to communicate effectively has such an impact. And I think that's something that we've all realized. And, and then three, it's incumbent upon us in government to really think strategically and clearly about how to communicate these issues in a very a way that gets public support. So I'm not using sea level rise a lot when we're talking about how we're going to respond to sea level rise. Coastal flooding is something that really got our community engaged because we have El Nino last year. So we had El Nino coastal flooding workshops. We had 400 people at one of our workshops, the most highly attended public meeting in our city's history. It's not a lot for a lot of communities, but for us it was a big deal. And really made an effort to do as much as we could publicly to educate them on this. But you know, frankly, these are different types of issues. Mm -hmm. We're being asked to make decisions on things that will happen in 100 years, and frankly, that's pretty far out in the time scale. But, you know, I think we're, fi we're getting smarter about how to do things. And then finally, I'm the chair of the Shoreline Preservation Committee for San Diego County, San Diego Association of Governments. It's every coastal city in San Diego. It's Republican, Democrat, whatever. And it's been interesting how it's nonpartisan, it's non-ideological, there's no drama. It's real, we're, we're, cities are getting to, starting to do sea level rise planning, and when they do the maps mm -hmm. and the science comes into play in a really smart way, they get it and realize, wow, we need to start thinking about restoration and resiliency and moving those pump stations inland. So, um, you know, it can be done. There are some challenging times ahead, really challenging times for those of us who work on things like this, and we're just going to have to be a lot smarter and a lot more resilient and just not, and realize that this isn't supposed to be easy. It's, it, it's gonna be some tough times ahead, but we'll deal with it. Yeah, well, you can awesome. do that. Um, Annika, I, I'm just gonna come to you. I, I think that, I mean, a, a lot of the, the, the stuff that we've been talking about um, today has been, uh, or elements have been focused on education. I'm conscious that um, so far we've focused on um, educating kids uh, and people um, who live along coastlines which probably makes it a whole lot easier because you go out into the field, you can go and you, know, you can see what's going on. But how do we educate, how do we make sure that the people who um, sit, live in a city or live in, uh, you know, inland in the United States and or Europe and or anywhere else, how do we engage those people in the issues that, we're, that the oceans are facing? So there's a few points that come to mind um, that have already been discussed as well. Um, from Algalita's point of view, um, getting people or getting students, small groups of students from um, areas around the globe where less privileged or landlocked countries, getting them out um, and providing their, their trip and that education, that whole experience to them um, is really impactful. And they can go back, so bringing them out to where they can experience the issue and learn about it with like-minded peers who are just as excited and interested in engaging in the solution, they can bring that experience back to their home, or their home country, their town, and they are then the instigators of change in their local community. Mm -hmm. And also going back to, um, uh, I lost my thought now. Um, yeah, just providing that experience to them um, and bringing, and now that we have uh, that were in the digital age, bringing that experience into their, um, into their communities. Um, and also, in, in getting away from education, um, in terms of solving the plastics issue, because that's always going to be connected to, to land, that's where the plastic is coming from, um, finding solutions um, that not, are not necessarily um, what we would think of in, in coastal communities, but really reframing the, the picture to something that um, they are interested in, something that impacts them. For example, the microfiber issue, again, with clothes washing and, and uh, losing those fibers. Those fibers are ending up in, in tributaries in their, and lakes in their local community. So um, everyone is connected to the water somehow because as humans, we need water to live. So yeah, there's always gonna be that connection, but just kind of reframing the reframing the problem in something that they can understand um, and that is directly impacting their community is mm. going to be important in getting those communities involved. Yeah, and I think, I mean, one, just, just to chip in or chime in, um, one of the things that we do from an education point of view um, is we have live expeditions um, going on uh, in the Arctic or from, from somewhere in the ocean. Um, and there's uh, opportunities for, for kids to, to uh, and we work with Skype, um, and so we Skype into 
um, the expedi expedition's live and they can talk to the, the scientists live from an expedition, um, which, you know, for, a, for a, a school in the Midwest or wherever it might be, and that's, that's pretty, pretty special. Look, I, I'm conscious that we, we're very, um, uh, that time is running low, um, but I'm also conscious that you guys may have some questions. So I just want to open up maybe a t for two questions to, the, to, to you in the audience um, for our panel here. So does anybody have a, a question? If not, you guys have got off lightly. Oh, yes, sir. We've got a mic running to you. When we, address, when we address greenhouse gases, we usually focus immediately on carbon and carbon dioxide. But there are several greenhouse gases, and one of them that concerns me is nitrogen trifluoride, which actually we produce as human beings in our wonderful flat panel monitors and our solar panels. It's used as a plasma etching uh, capability, and it's... 17,000 times more heat absorptive than CO2. And it's going up in the oceans at 10% per year. So have we really identified the smoking guns or are we just chasing rabbits? <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's somebody here that can and, uh, really address that. Um, that's. That kind of question for, is, is really way out of my field. I, I know more about the effects of global warming on oceans and the organisms in them, not about the chemistry. I don't know if anybody else I, th I think it's, you know, it's, it's one, of those, you know, one of those things that I think what we've done so far is, is focus on s some of the areas um, that the oceans are, are, uh, are facing. Um, there are evidently other areas that either some of us have never heard of or don't know about, but need to be communicated. Um, and it's how, the, how we communicate that into panels like this, uh, to people like yourselves, and into, um, and into education as well. So I think it's a great question, and then something that we probably all need to know a little bit more about. Yeah, I'd love to talk with you more at the break. And then as to your last point, um, I think, are we just... Um, chasing rabbits or are we really getting to the root of, root of the problem is really everything, the, the great thing about the, the world and the, how it function is that everything is connected. So actions that we're addressing through one issue are likely going to impact a, a huge range of issues. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's always going to be important to get to the root of the issue, but we should really just start where we can. Yeah. That, that would be my viewpoint. Great. Thank you very much. Now, can I just very briefly thank my panelists um, today and obviously to you guys um, out in the audience. Um, I think it's been a very interesting session and, and doubtless John will, uh, will, will say, <laughs> say a few words to, to get us off stage. No, thank Here we you. Go. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you.